Welcome to No Instructions, I'm Bob. And I'm Josh. We were just talking about pineapple. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we started recording, I remembered, have you had the pineapple dole, dole pineapple, oh, what do they call it? At Disney World, in Frontierland. Nope. So there's this thing in Frontierland. Actually, I don't know, I guess it's the Frontier part. Anyway, over in that Adventureland area. Or is it Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse? Yes, right across from that. Okay. There's a dull pineapple stand, and you get pineapple juice poured over pineapple soft serve in this giant cup, hmm. and it is so good. I love pineapple stuff, and that is one of my favorite pineapple things. And it's like this big. That's it's like big. A, like a 32 ounce. Like a big gulp. Yeah. All the pineapples. Do you remember... Way back when, yeah, uh, when you guys were starting out making it, and you were taking questions from uh, people in the community. Do you remember the question that I asked? Because I was listening to it. I remember I was trimming a palm tree up on a ladder, and I was listening, and I'm like, "They said my name and my thing," and then you guys made fun of me. No, I don't remember that at all. What was it? It was why. Why does your tongue get all itchy when you eat a lot of pineapple? <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> I don't remember that being you, though. That's funny. Yeah, that was me. Because I had just, like, I don't know, I love pineapple. Like, we were talking about, we would go scuba diving, and when we come out of the water, we'd all share a pineapple, and it's just, I don't know, it's pineapple's yummy. But if you eat pineapple fresh off of the pine, when you <laughs> right cut it, line. when you cut it, and, like, the center core has some kind of, I don't know, acid or something in it, then when you eat it, like, it's, I don't know, it does something to your tongue, and it makes your tongue kind of, like, yeah itchy. <clears throat> itchy's probably not the word, but <laughs> makes John feel itchy. And then you guys made fun of me for that. And then later on, I think I, I sent something to you, and you recanted your your uh, your stance on it because I provided academic evidence to hmm. such things. But yeah, I don't know if you if you remembered that. Don't, uh, vaguely, me, I don't remember much about it, but I do remember the the itchy question. Vaguely, oh. um, did you know that if you eat a whole bunch of pineapple? Like, overeat it, it will kill parasites in your belly. Get rid of your, your gut bacteria? Uh, I don't know about that, but, like, if you have, like, a worm of some sort. Oh, that's sort, a good thing. Yeah. 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 So that's why a lot of the people that live in, like, remote areas of, you know, like South America, where there's a lot of parasitic stuff in the water, they don't necessarily get it because they also eat a lot of acidic fruits. Hmm. I have that's to not, start. like, globally true, but I know that is a thing. I have to start every day with a glass, or not even glass, like a couple <laughs> swigs of orange juice. Really? There's something about that, like that really acidic, pungent taste that kind of wakes me up, even though I'm fully awake. Hmm. I have a lot of weird morning, I say a lot, of like weird <laughs> morning routines. Yeah. And that's one of them. Like I get really upset if I open the refrigerator and there's no orange juice. I'm like like, uh, like a baby. <laughs> uh, like I feel like I'm not starting off like... Like, how people, like, can't function until they have a cup of coffee. Like, yeah. I drink coffee, but I'm nowhere near that level. Like, I could just not drink coffee. But the orange juice is that thing. Like, something acidic. Huh. So, it's like, we have some... We have a thing of lime juice right now. This recipe I'm using making... Or making <clears throat> uses lime juice. So, that'll kind of do. But I don't Weird. know why I that is. I wouldn't see that as a replacement for orange juice. Because of, like, the sweetness. It's not even sweet. It's just that, like, that kick. I don't... I, don't, huh. I can't explain it. When I was deployed, there was a, just a lot of bland, gross food, and someone would bring in pallets of cranberry juice, which I couldn't stand cranberry juice yeah. forever, except there, because it was this really bold, like vibrant, sour, kind of acidic like taste, and it was like, yeah, I got to have that. Hmm. So now when I wake up in the morning, I don't know if it's now, but like, I want that little crisp of acidity. Interesting. I do like orange juice a whole lot, but, you know, I don't need it every day to function. I get grumpy <clears> if I don't have it, just because I'm like, man, it needs to be there. I feel like something's missing. Hmm. Like most people do with coffee. It's funny, like with coffee, I drink a lot of coffee. I don't necessarily feel like I need the coffee part of it, but I really like having a hot drink in the morning. Something hmm. about that is the wake up, and I could I could have tea. I just don't really enjoy the flavor of tea as much. It's not bad, just not you know as interesting to me. But I never felt like I needed coffee for the caffeine necessarily. It's more just like it's nice to have a warm thing in the morning. 
<clears throat> my throat I, I is jacked up right now, and I'm going to be clearing my throat a lot. Sorry, everybody. Well, we made it worse because we had popsicles <clears throat> we right just before did we started. Pineapple with. popsicles, which is how this whole thing got started. Yep. But yeah. Well, anyway, we set ourselves up for failure. We did. What What's going on? What you working on over there? Something, um, something new. I, yeah, I got a new set because I finished the micro fighter thing pretty quickly last time. Which I found that they have, I don't see why I'm so surprised, but they have an actual, like, escape pod that's made to scale for the minifigs. So I thought about getting that, too. Oh, yeah. The bigger one? Yeah. But I, I got another helicopter, because, uh, surprise, I like helicopters. <laughs> so this is a Lego Technic. Um, it's, it's based off a Eurocopter design. I think this is a 135, an easy 135. Not a 145, Bob. Mm, yeah, I mean, obviously. Come on now. Doy. But the one that flies around town, yeah, uh, the aeromedical one, it's that model. So it's small. Hmm. It's got a little winch. Got a little uh, little bay door on the back. Yeah, another helicopter. Cool. You still chugging away? Still working on the lunar lander module, and I'm in the last little bit here. So I'm doing the top section. I'll probably be done with this one in just a few minutes because most of the pieces left are like. Big chunky pieces. So, and honestly, I, this isn't that really interesting of a set. I'm a little disappointed. It that set technically isn't that difficult. No. Um, you have to be into the subject matter, I think. Well, I mean, I enjoy space stuff, and I wanted this set because of the spaceness of it. <laughs> but like you know, just as a as a build, it's just not very interesting of a build. I don't know. Not bad, but these sets, these creator ones, these kind of special ones are pretty expensive. They it's, they market these things really well. Yeah. They make you really want it, even th- though it's yeah. it's a Lego set just like everything else is. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Is I I expect a little more out of these even though I shouldn't. Yeah. Just the same set, but Yeah, but now so that this, this one's about done. Uh, <clears throat> it's been formally announced. <clears throat> Do we want to talk about our relationship to this lunar mission that you're Yeah, sure. Go for it. So you were contacted by Miss Jen Schechter, who works at Tested.com mm-hmm. with Adam Savage, for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Adam is going to do a live build of the Apollo 11 command module hatch. The hatch. Based out of a bunch of pieces <clears throat> that are hodgepodge together from, I think, 40 different creators they had a list of people so yeah some lot. people that we know uh jimmy dress is making one bill and Britt from mm-hmm. punch props evan and caitlin were on there um some other names i recognized from making it as some of your patreon supporters were on there i forgot who it was now hmm. i kind of glanced over the list this old tony who's a machinist mm-hmm. uh, a bunch of people but they sent out a bunch of 3d cad files for components of the hat so they're making a one-to-one <laughs> replica of all of the pieces. They don't necessarily have to work. Yeah, it's non-functioning. I think it's yeah. a big thing. And Jen Schechter did things like this for like the Nation of Makers where the, she did a Rosie the Riveter. Like a massive, huge, it was like a 10 foot tall, you know, a 3D model of the Rosie the Riveter World War II poster woman for, you know, women uh, helping out with the war effort and working in factories. And so they took a bunch of chunks of the model and then people 3D modeled it into I think it was just like a skin tone color so whatever the artist you know saw yeah. as skin tone and then they compiled them all together into this gigantic massive thing and so in that same light they're doing it and they're going to be doing it at the Smithsonian in DC the Air and Space Museum mm-hmm. uh, in July sometime uh, yeah I don't remember the date exactly but I mean it's it's a really interesting idea I think I didn't know anything about that door until this all happened, and I looked into it a little bit, and they, they passed around some information about it. And apparently this hatch took, I think, three layers of previous mechanism <clears throat> to open, to seal something like that, mm-hmm. and combined three layers of stuff into one layer. And so this one door is significant because it's a big engineering feat to solve a whole bunch of problems at one time. And when you look at it, from th- there's two pictures. There's a front picture, which is the outside, and then the back picture, which is the inside where all the mechanism is. And you look at the front of it, and you're like, how is this even like a... This is like a... I don't know. It's like a single sheet Yeah, of it's material. like a smooth shell with a little circular window. Yeah. 
And then you flip it around, and it's like, whoa, there's like a car mm-hmm. exploded on the inside <laughs> of this door. And there's so many parts and all these little latches and stuff that all work together. And so it's pretty interesting. It'll be cool to see everybody's doing their own material. You can do anything that's non-perishable. Non-perishable. Yeah. Can My you, first idea got thrown right out the window. Make it out of cheese, whiz. So it'll be really interesting to see what everybody decides to use and how many different methods there are. And you know, some people will probably go for the craziest possible thing they can think of. Uh, we're going, I want to say safe, but it's not really safe. No, it's because been it's a pain in the butt. Difficult. <laughs> but um, safe from the perspective of I wanted it to be exact and make sure that, you know, we could deliver something that was usable uh, by Adam. But we're not done yet. Nope. Luckily, they extended the deadline, so we've got a little bit more time to keep working on it. But Yeah, because we would have been uh, not have done it. <laughs> we, we would have been, <laughs> I would have been. I would have said late. <laughs> I'm like, nope, it wouldn't have been late. It we would have been, been working harder in the last few days, I think, probably to to account for it. The deadline. Uh, I'm missing. I'm not missing. I just can't find a piece. And I'm really close to the end, and I want to be able to finish this. Where's the piece? Yeah, so we're, we're doing that thing. Um, we're not really probably making any content around it. That was the original idea, but it's, it's been something we're working on in the background, kind of around everything else. And so it's just hard to capture. And I don't know that it's really like a a complete story. The story's not there. I mean, the story like that we (laughs) just explained is there, but you know, it's a big collaborative project with a bunch of people all over the place, but that is like a sentence of dialogue Yeah. Yeah. and would be hard to encapsulate the gravity of the whole thing. Like we wouldn't have been able to get final shots of our of our completed piece, so we would have made this True. little yeah. this little mechanical looking widget that by itself just looks like kind of nothing. I mean, it fits probably in the palm of your hand because there's so many people making different pieces, and a lot of the pieces are repetitive because mm-hmm. it's a latch. We have one of the latch like roller assemblies that is one of fifteen that goes around the perimeter. So when you pull the the handle, the, it's attached by linkages that will push all of the the rollers to you know latch the door close against the inside and by itself doesn't look like a whole lot so there's not really a whole lot of beauty shot unless we would go to dc and you know get it in in place which would be kind of cool i'm all for it i know a lot of people in dc we can go on a field trip (laughs) me and travel i'm just like nope there's got to be a really good reason for me to go anywhere at this point i don't feel like it (laughs) i'll go (laughs) It would be cool to see, but no. I don't know how long it's going to be cool. on display. Uh, I read it, but I don't really remember. I'm yeah. sure they'll announce that. And there will be pictures, and I think they're doing a live build, so I'm pretty sure you can follow along with it. And... All right, I'm missing a piece. Oh, jeez. Oh, what am I going to do? Um, either I already used it and I shouldn't have, or I don't know. Uh, well, anyway, I, I asked you, and then I interrupted you because I asked you about what you were making. What's new? What's going on? What's happened this last week? What day is it? These, I don't know. It's oh, it's... I, I found it. Wednesday. I used the wrong pieces. Mm. Cool. Oh, we went to the zoo. I know we talked about going to do stuff during the summer with the kids. Yeah. And my father-in-law got our <clears> kids <throat> a season pass to the Louisville Zoo. So we drove up to the big city. <laughs> and uh, went to the zoo. Cool. It was nice. Yeah. It was kind of hot, and I was doing really well, and the kids were doing fairly decent until, ooh, you would like this, until the slushy conversation came up. <laughs> Bob loves slushies. I love slushies, slushies, slushies man. all the time. Not all the time. We've and gotten so them a few times. They get you at the zoo. Twice. When you walk right in the door, there's a slushy stand, and I went, ooh, and they have a bunch of different flavors, mm. but they give you this big commemorative, like, goofy-looking baseball field looking cup thing with a huge straw. you have to buy that one? I don't know. Hmm. I just wanted a small one. I'm like, I kind of want one of those. And she's like, well, okay, then we got to get the kids all one. And I'm like, oh, they're going to argue and they're going to fight. And all right, I don't want to do this right now. And then toward the end, when everybody was losing their mind, it was getting hot. And I'm like, I just want to go. I just want to get in the van and I want to go make progress somewhere air conditioned. I want to get the kids moving toward something where they're not just aimlessly wandering around angry. And Tiff's like, well, let's stop and get slushies now because it'll be nice and cool. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I'll, I'll put the brakes on to let's get out of here. And then it, everybody was screaming at the slushie stand. 
No one was making any progress. There was a lot of him hawing back and forth like, well, should we do this? Should we get them all one to share or should we do this and should we do that? And my wife is so patient and she's amazing and she's trying to think of everybody. And at that point, I I fully acknowledge that I had succumbed to the kids' grumpy yeah. whininess level Yeah, because I was ready to go. And she was trying to make the situation better. <clears throat> and then I was like, I don't care what happens. Someone just do something because I'm ready to leave. And then... She shut down, and we stormed out. And if you've ever had your kids standing in front of the slushy or the toy or the whatever that they want with your credit card in your hand <laughs> and then put it right back in your pocket and make an about face and leave, they don't take too kindly to that. Yeah. Newsflash. That's provocation. <laughs> yeah. We dangled. I dangled a big carrot, and then my wife reacted to me being a pouty, whiny baby. Yeah. And we left, and then the world erupted. Hmm. So the zoo was fun. It all imploded on itself toward the end. And I was part of the destruction team. And I was not mm. uh, a co-parent at that point. Not a proud moment. No, I did not feel great. But the zoo was cool. I got really close to a rhino. And I think if I try hard enough, I could touch it. <laughs> we were there one time. And uh, we saw the rhino pen or whatever. And I'm like up ahead of the kids. I'm like, oh, cool. The rhino's like sleeping. It's right there. It's really close. And the kids just come running up the path because they're just being kids. And they're like, ah, screaming. They all freak out the rhino. And it gets up and runs away behind a boulder or oh. something. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> like, you, killed it. you just missed your chance. Well, there was no one around the rhino when we got there. And it was off in this little corner. And there's a little path thing you can go see. And so it was like, it was right there. My three-year-old could... Not that she would, or I would encourage it, but she could throw something and hit the rhino. It was that close. And so it was laying on the ground. <laughs> we tried, but I mean, you know. <laughs> well, I got to go get it. But we were sitting there, and the kids were about to leave, and they all turned around, and the rhino farted, like, super loud. Awesome. <laughs> Nature is such a beautiful thing. It is. <laughs> That's, you're pretty lucky, actually. That's pretty funny. Yeah, right? Most people don't get the chance to hear a rhino fart. Uh, they have a polar bear? And I realized yeah. I had never seen a polar bear in person. Really? Yeah. They're huge. Yeah. And scary. And this little girl was like, it looks like a big dog. <laughs> like, well, yeah. Kinda, maybe. Yes. What kind of dog do you have? Or well, that's your frame of reference, but maybe. Actually, I don't know. when we lived in Savannah, our next door neighbors had somebody over one time. And I don't know who the people were or what kind of dog they had. But I looked over and we had a chain link fence, which is a kind of standard height, you know, uh, probably four feet, something. <clears throat> there was a dog whose head, standing still, was over the top of the fence. Hmm. And it was solid white. And it looked like a giant white wolf thing from some fantasy novel. Hmm. And I looked out the window, I'm like, what in the world is that thing? And the kids were running around in the backyard, and I'm like, I don't know. Like, it might eat them. I don't know. <laughs> it might take Should I go children. out there? And by the time I got out to like, hey, let's go see if we can ask them about the dog... They left or something. So it was, maybe it wasn't even real. It vanished. <laughs> it was a figment of my imagination. It's like the wolf from Never Ending Story. Falcor. Um, what about you guys? How was your weekend? Yeah, weekend, weekend. How was the weekend? You know, I have no idea. I don't remember either, other than the zoo. I remember it goes by so fast. It really does. Um, we have some friends in town, and they got here Sunday. So I'm trying to figure out what we did before that. Oh, yeah, we went for a hike on Saturday. <clears throat> um, all of us went out together and tromped through some mud and found some cool animals and same place the water and stuff. Yep, same place. Uh, well, a place that we haven't really talked about yet. Mm. Um, but it was cool. We had a good time. Put up a trampoline for the kids to bounce on. Um... You know, kind of uneventful. Nothing nothing crazy. I, but you said something earlier about... <clears throat> sorry, I'm from my throat. Kind of being ready to go. And I, sometime in the last week or so, kind of realized... Like, I think everybody can, at some point gets to the place to where, like, I'm done... Or, or not even out of frustration. Like, I'm ready to move to the next thing. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be somewhere. I'm ready to finish eating. I'm ready to whatever. You're done. And you have to wait on other people. 
<clears throat> as a parent, goodness, my throat, as a parent, that's often waiting on the kids. But I also realized, and maybe this is just a distinction in my head, but I think it's not that I'm impatient necessarily. I am impatient. I know that about myself. But I think that thing where people in general are ready to go, but the world around them is not ready to go with them, it's a pace thing. And I started trying to think about it that way. That, like, it's not that I want to get out of situations. It's not that I want other people to necessarily do things when I want them to. But I just realized, like, I have an internal pace that I do things at. Mm -hmm. Everything. When I'm ready to go to bed, I go to bed. I don't, like, wait around for everybody to be settled and stuff. I don't, you know, when I'm ready to eat, I need to eat. Otherwise, I'm going to get grumpy or whatever. <clears throat> And so I just started thinking about all these different things about me that are, they're my normal pace. And it's not that I'm really being impatient necessarily all the time, but, um, you know, I want to keep the pace that I go at. And I realized because of that, maybe that fits into like when I go run, I don't like running with other people. Mm. Um, because I don't like having to worry about whether I'm keeping up with somebody or whether they're keeping up with me or like trying to adjust what I'm doing. Like that's a time I just want to go do my thing yeah, and not worry about anybody else. But I think there, that carries over into more of my life. I don't really have a point with that, but it was just kind of a, I don't know, a realization about like, it's not always about being impatient, but we naturally have paces that we do things at. Well, when you when I have to stop, like the pace that you're talking about, like with the zoo, or you know if we're at a store or if we're eating dinner, like I think it's it's natural. Anybody just operates. You walk at a certain pace, you eat at a certain rate. When you're ready to be done, you're kind of done. Yeah. And I think it's a lot of personal growth to be able to stop, like my train of thought or my path along whatever activity we're doing is finished. Let's engage somewhere else or let's be useful or let's yeah. start up another thing in this kind of venue to where I'm like, well, I'm done. And rather than whine about everybody be slow, which I think is my natural tendency and a lot of people's natural tendency, especially kids, is to just like, in lieu of whining, just be quiet. Mm. And so yeah. I will just kind of sit there. And I've noticed that at my like in-law's house, like we go there... I don't know, however many times a year for big family get-togethers. But when we lived in Alabama, which was like an hour and a half from my wife's family, we would go every month because they would have a monthly birthday thing. And it's like, oh, we're going to go have lunch there. And then I would eat lunch, and then I would be done. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't want to complain. So in lieu of complaining, I'm just going to sit here and be still, which I think in my mind was proper, but in the more social and loving and engaging and welcoming and warm sense it was very aloof hmm. it was the opposite of what probably other people right. on the outside think i should have been doing and so I just, that's why in the videos uh, a lot of recently people are like why is josh always making an angry face i'm like <laughs> i'm not making an angry face i'm just i'm literally not doing anything i'm i'm net neutral at that point yeah like i'm not whining that uh, that other people are slow or not able to do what I want them to do. At the same time, I'm not complaining that I don't have anything to do. I'm just not doing anything. Right, you're just there for the time being until the next yeah. thing. Yeah. And until step B happens, and then boom, it's time to engage. Yeah. And where I break down with my kids is at dinner time. I'm like, okay, I think eating dinner takes this reasonable amount of time for me. <laughs> then there's a reasonable amount of time for another human adult, and then a very gracious amount of time for a miniature adult and the children and then my kids like to go further like miles past that <laughs> in my mind time allotment yeah and that's where i'm like oh my goodness just be done like there's only so long i can sit there idle faced and play a song in my head until other people are finished and my kids don't have that that social consciousness to go like oh, that person looks bored. Maybe I should like yeah. increase my rate so that we could continue to do a thing as a group. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely something about like <clears throat> maturity and awareness of the people around you. Mm -hmm. Like the kids... They don't care? They don't care because they don't know that they should yet, I think. 
to a point. And one of the things we've always tried to get our kids to be aware of is like your actions are affecting the people around you Mm -hmm. immediately around you in this way, good or bad, you know, like you have the chance to affect people around you in a really good way. But if you're rude or if you're loud or if you're slow or if you're messy, that has an effect on the people that are within arm's reach of you every day. Um, And that's one of those things that they don't get until at some point they get but you just, I feel like we have to, part of our job is to continually remind them of that to help them get it sooner. Because, I mean, that's, that, I was talking about, like, compassion, like, teaching compassion to the kids. That's, like, one of the rooted things. You have to be aware that there are people around you who can be affected before compassion means anything, right? Before, hmm. like, action towards another person, toward, before servanthood actually does anything, you have to realize that somebody needs to be served. And if you're unaware of the people then, like, that's not going to do any good. I can yeah. talk about servanthood up and down, but serve who? Myself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So. But I think in that that's moment, like, where, you know, they're eating and stuff, like, they're just not even aware that there's somebody else who's probably waiting on them. Just, well, and when we're at it in public, I think one of my triggers with them is them being loud for that very reason. Yeah. I'm like, there are more people <clears throat> in this small space than just you you are affecting other people and you don't know or you don't care and that's rude and kind of selfish and again they might not fully understand because they don't have that perspective of of being irritated by a loud screaming child (laughs) or they're just happy that maybe there's another loud screaming child with them there are along with for the ride but and i think i i will go like you are being loud like be quiet be, and not explain like, yo, you're talking that loud and you're taking that person out of their moment. And I try to do this at the movie theater because mm. my son is the loud talker at the movie theater. And every time I realize it's a learning process and I'm like, you know how excited you are about this movie when we walk it. Yes. I go, what if I decided to just ruin it and just take you out of that movie and, and pull you out right after the first scene? You'd be super mad. Go, well, yeah. I go, that's what you're doing when you're talking really loud. Hmm. People pay good money to sit in here and experience this movie for them. When you're talking really loud and you're being obnoxious, they're thinking about you and they're going to miss something in this movie. Hmm. I was like, that is the exact same thing that if I were just to like pick you up and run out of here with you over my shoulder, yeah. you'd be mad at me. And having them not only be able, I think, to process their own emotions half of the time is, is battle enough for a child, <laughs> but then that's, to try to true. project that feeling onto another person. Like, imagine how the other person feels. And even as an yeah. adult, that's extremely difficult oh, because yeah. you're projecting, I think, <clears throat> I, I can speak for me, that I over-project how the, my actions or my kids' actions affect other people. <clears throat> I go, there is a possibility that you are ruining that person's dinner. Not because of just pure jubilation or just some natural, visceral reaction. Just because you're, just, you're bored and you're being loud. Like, there's no justification for you being that loud. Right. You're just doing it because you just don't care. And sometimes you'll get the people in a restaurant that will come up and be like, you're doing such a good job. They did such a good job. That is the best thing (laughs) in the history of parenting. When some random person walks up and tells you that your kids are behaving well in the restaurant. Yeah. And then on the inside, you're going. (laughs) Like, really? Really? (laughs) They did? They're like, cool. Huh. Well, we faked you out, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Man, those... I've never won an Academy Award, (laughs) but I'm pretty (laughs) sure it would be on par with such an accolade. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. They're potentially making you think about my kid instead of eating that rice pilaf that you're eating there. That's unacceptable. (laughs) And... You know, that, that's kind of obnoxious sometimes, and they are children, and you have to be able to give them grace and understand that they're who they are, and they have to learn, and all of the things that we talk about on the show. Uh, but sometimes they're just, they're butts, and they're loud for no reason. <laughs> that is true. But, I mean, we, we do, I think uh, you can work against this, but we do naturally try to teach adult behavior to a kid who's not able to be an adult. 
right? So we want them to be considerate of other people. We want them to think about the stuff around them. We don't want them to do things that are stupid and dangerous and mean and things. And as an adult, you, a well-adjusted adult, should be able to at least process that stuff and realize, like, oh, yeah, I shouldn't be a jerk to people or whatever. But <clears throat> at some point, the kids are not capable of that. And we're still expecting a lot of them, maybe yeah. more than they are capable of, you know, actually producing. And that's where the grace comes in. Um, but as a parent, yeah, it's it's really hard not to just expect adult behavior out of a child who's incapable of being an adult. <clears throat> or the norms that society has put on adults that you're trying to translate to a child. No, yeah, that's true. That you, I'm still trying to fully flesh out. Like as a as, as a, a white man with white kids, like my kids play with an entire like dynamic group of children. And so one of my youngest kids was like the, the his friend and he talks to his friend and he doesn't acknowledge that he, his friend is black. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's a win. Yeah. Like, hooray. I don't have to explain like ethnic groups. It's just, it's a kid like hooray. And then when they get older, they make weird comments like, you know, the guy with the brown skin. I'm like, Ooh, you can't say that. I'm like, I, but in his mind, like you're not his, wrong. His skin is, Brown, I'm like, I don't know how to address this, but I don't... Well, okay, so in Savannah, Savannah was very um, ethnically... Diverse? Not uh, Diverse, not really. It was very, oh. like, down the middle, black and white. Whereas a lot of places, you know, there's a, ma- there's a majority and there's a minority. It was very in the middle there, which was great. It was great for the kids. They went to school with a lot of kids that did not look like them. Awesome. And the same thing that you're saying, they would come home and talk about their friends and about like their friend's hair and their friend, their friend's skin and stuff. And they are literally saying, like you would say, you know, the guy with the long hair, they would say my brown skin friend, so-and-so there's nothing negative about what they're saying, but yeah, we're pushing all of this. Like Mm -hmm. if I said, excuse me, if I said that it would be taken with, you know, I pointed that out for some specific reason. Um, and so we tried to teach them in that space, like, you're not doing anything wrong, but somebody may take offense to the way that you describe them. So try to think of a way to describe your friends that is, uh, you know, their hair, blonde haired kid, brown haired kid, um, the tall kid, the short kid, you know, the one with the cool haircut or, you know, trying to like think yep. of things that are not about the necessarily the the... I don't want to say dangerous things, but the things that could be taken incorrectly. Like, you would never want to say the fat kid. That, to me, is almost worse than saying the brown skin kid because it's like an insult, not an observation yeah. necessarily. <clears throat> so there was a lot of that, and there still is, and of us like trying to teach them the correct way to describe somebody, even though it is absolutely benign, the thing that they're saying. You know, it's not negative, but it's like when you grow up, that won't work the same, probably. So... Figure out a way to describe people that is not going to get you in trouble with the wrong person later on. And, I mean, that kind of sucks that we have to do that, but it's, you know, the world we live in. And but I, I think uh, along the lines <clears throat> of trying to project, like, social norms onto a kid, you know, trying to be respectful to other people, trying to acknowledge when people yeah. are around you, um, it's really hard to, to try to address, like, social issues to a child that has no frame of reference. Right. Like they're just playing with that kid. Yeah. And I remember when I was a kid, there was, um, you're, you're probably too old. Anthony, do you remember weekly <laughs> readers? <laughs> Thanks. See, Anthony acknowledges. Do you know what weekly readers are? Gramps? No. It's like a newspaper. I'm not going to respond <laughs> since you called me Gramps. I'm not even going to respond to that. The weekly reader was a thing you got in school every. It was like the kind of newsprint week. little. Yeah, they were telling us that we're yeah. all going to live on the moon and all this. Yeah, and it had this thing. I remember this one stuck out very vividly about racism, and it was like, where is racism first instilled? And it was a multiple choice little questionnaire thing on there, huh. and it had a right or wrong answer, which I thought at the time was stupid. And I remember I had to been in like the third grade or weekly readerish elementary school age, and it was like on TV in the home. Uh, and a couple other places. And I was like, on TV? And they're like, no, it's in the home. Hmm. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. Like, that wasn't a thing in, in my house. Like, yeah. everybody was treated equal. I had a, I lived on a military base. It was surrounded by 
the most diverse group of kids and just I didn't like that kid because that guy that kid's kind of a jerk or like that girl is super funny. Everybody had their own things, and then when you got older, society I think as a I'm speaking for myself like society taught me that that person was different than me. And like I sat on the bus next to the South Korean girl, and then whenever we were in middle school, it's like oh she has to go hang out with the with the Asian kids, right. and it's it's weird now. Like I don't know why it was weird. Yeah, and the same thing like. Not that you should segregate your kids to play with people that look like them, but I mean, it's at a certain age or at a certain point in their life, they're going to be confronted with, you shouldn't say somebody has brown skin or you shouldn't like, he doesn't know that we are white because we don't look white. Right. He doesn't understand or they don't understand these, these cultural norms that society has placed on people for, I mean, really negatively associated, um, not even stereotypes, like the, the history of the, the country and of the world that we live in, you know, has been pretty terrible. And so as a new generation of people, I don't know how to help them. Well, and it's, it's hard to, because you have to like, in, in the case of them talking about their friends and skin color, just as a way to describe them, you want to like talk to them about that so that they are sensitive to what they're saying even though they don't know what they're saying, but you also don't want to like introduce racism yes, by that. explaining that for their own benefit. Like yep. that sucks, but that's kind of what happens. Like you have to say, well, there's people that don't like other people because of these reasons. Oh, does that mean I shouldn't like them? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Don't, no, no, no. They're, those people are wrong, but you still have to be sensitive to how you're talking about people. So, there's something different? No, no, there's nothing different. Then why do I have to be sensitive to it? Uh, <laughs> yes, you're, you're introducing a problem. That's, that's a I, drag. And I, I think as a, as a white man, I shouldn't come up with a re- an <clears throat> oh, answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Like, but then that in itself, I don't know what is culturally insignificant or what is the right step toward, like, an eight-year-old learning just to be friends with people and acknowledging something before it gets to a point where they're thrust into an environment. Say they're going into middle school. I remember middle school to me was that, that break point where like, Oh, there's, there's clicks. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like a, a fifth grade class. Everybody in the class is in the class. And that's, that was the, the group dynamic was, it was lumped together by teacher. Yeah. Now in middle school, you have a lot more open, free, kind of roaming areas where you meet a lot more people you have different people interest groups clump. yeah so yeah. you you group together by these assumed <clears throat> interests and the in groups and the out groups yeah and so before it gets to that point like uh, there's got to be some way to introduce a a well intended well anyway, catch you no, no, go ahead. yeah i mean i think it's I think it's going back a step and like I was talking about compassion about teaching the kids to be aware and considerate of everyone around them to treat people a certain way. Yep. And then when that distinction comes up, whether you introduce it or society introduces it, it's like, Oh, remember how we've always talked about how we're just kind to people. That's people. It's not, All people. It's, it's not those people or these people or some people. We, we've always taught you to be kind to people, you know. So I think if you put some of that stuff, um, expectations on how they should treat other humans, <laughs> not, not any subgroup of those humans, if you put that in place early enough, I would hope that it would help when the race conversation comes up. You can be like, oh, well, that's a thing that some people, but that's not what we do. We've never done that in this family. We've mm-hmm. never talked like that. We've never treated people that way, right? And they go, oh, yeah, I guess we haven't. Um, so I, I guess it's not really necessarily about addressing each one of those individual social problems, uh, like one at a time. Obviously, they're all going to come up. We're going to have to talk to the kids, talk to the kids about all these different things that are out there that they need to be aware of and stuff. But I think it starts with figuring out how you as a family treat people and instilling that. Yep. I guess. I finished my lander. <clears throat> I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it is. It's like a gray thing with gold things on it. That is upside down. No, it's not. I mean, it probably is, but 
That would be the worst antenna in the whole oh, history it's an of antenna? antenna. I thought it was like the <laughs> poop shoot. Maybe that's like where they get rid of all the. I don't know. Well, I can luckily snap it around. There you go. Right there. Now I can. I guess what? There's no gravity. Eagle, we so can you hear can, you now. You can shoot the poop out of the top of the. <laughs> you can shoot you the poop to. wherever you want to. <clears throat> all right. So how far are we in? Uh, Forty-one minutes. I'm going to start on another set. Okay. We're going to do some pros and cons. Yep. Anthony's oh. been chatting away on the Discord server. I got to show been, the set. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, you're doing it. Yeah. Boom. This is the Blockade Runner. This is a very large, very cool set. And I'm going to start it. Get out of here, Lander. So, pros and cons. Got pros and cons? Yeah. Anthony has been all over the Discord server. Patreon Discord server. Yep. Oh, that's neat. Go on yeah. patreon.com and you have access to the Discord server chat room. And you can talk with us live. So... Let's see here. Rebel, Rebel soldier. Brandon P. Hey, Brandon. Well, this isn't a pro. Ah, oh, man. This isn't a pro or con. This okay. is a this or that. Is that oh. acceptable? Uh, sure. Okay. Hang on. Proceed. Pie versus cake. Pie. What kind of pie? Hmm. I think that it would have to be that specific for me. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. So I, I really enjoy fruit pies. Okay. Not necessarily cherry. Cherry pies never really worked. It's because it's not doesn't taste like cherries. It's like ch- tastes like the goo. Mm-hmm. Yep. Peach pie, apple pie, super good. When I does like, a peach pie not become a cobbler? Is it that it has a flaky crust? It becomes a pie without a flaky crust. It's a cobbler. I don't know. Someone will correct us. My understanding is that a cobbler doesn't have. A crust on the bottom. Okay. It just has the layer on the top. I'll buy that. I think I might have just made that up, but it seems to work, right? right? Yeah. I, I got no qualms with that definition. So if let's talk about fruit pies specifically. Cake or pie? Mm, it goes back to what kind of cake. Like if it's a birthday cake, I don't like it. Yeah, I'm not a big fan. I think a birthday cake is kind of gross. It's just like frosting on top of the Is it the frosting the or the cake that's gross? The frosting. Yeah, definitely. Um, hmm. See, like, I would think like a cream pie shouldn't be called a pie if a fruit pie is a pie. What else would you call it? I don't know. They seem like two diametrically opposed things. Cream? Because if a cobbler is a an inverted pie. <laughs> okay. Right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. So a pie has a bottom, but not necessarily a top, but is also a pie if it has a bottom and a top? Pie, yeah. Man, so diverse. <laughs> I'm not opposed to pie. Okay. Uh, growing up in Florida, people serve key lime pie all over the place. Mm-hmm. I hate it. I think it's disgusting. I don't hate it, but I actually don't enjoy it as everybody around me thinks, I, as much as everybody thinks I do. Yeah. I don't look forward to it, and I probably wouldn't pick it. Oh. The tart, like, acidity and all that, that's for breakfast time, not for dessert. <laughs> I drink my pie yeah. only. All right, what's the next one? Mm-hmm. Working outside versus inside. Ooh. Uh, I think generally I prefer working inside, but that's only because I know where my stuff is inside. You know, like when we hmm. did the tree house, it was like such a pain. We'd go out there and we'd do one thing. And we're like, all right, we're moving. Oh, wait, we got to go get that one saw. I yep. walk all the way down into the shop and get the saw, find it, and then take it back out there and use it. And then two minutes later, realize we needed different screws. I have to go all the <laughs> way back to, you know. Living in Kentucky has really <clears throat> made me enjoy working outside. Hmm. Because in southern Georgia and Florida, working outside is torture. It is disgusting. You're on the, the face of the sun and... On Dagobah at the same time. <laughs> so there's nothing appealing about working outside in the South. I'm with you. It's suckies. So up here it's nice. Like, it's the middle of summer and it's like barely 80 degrees outside. Yeah. This is fall time. So <laughs> I mean, I like working outside up this here. This is currently that two weeks in, in fall where you're like, oh, it's not awful. <laughs> and then it, yeah. But there's no bugs. Like, that. I think that's the one thing. I think it depends on where you are outside. 
Because the prettiest day in southern Georgia is still worse. Like, just because you're being eaten by little stabby death gnats. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to be around this. This is not fun in any way. I want to get back inside. I do, but like bugs aside and heat aside, I do enjoy working outside. I just said side a whole bunch of times. I do enjoy like being outside and working on things, you know, like outdoor projects and stuff. That's, that stuff's fun. It's a change of pace and it's usually a change of scope because when you build stuff inside, it's usually maximum size. But like working on that tree house, that was just a much bigger mm-hmm. thing and you don't have to worry about doorways and you don't have to worry about stuff like that. I like it. Summer heat or winter cold? Ooh, winter cold. Any day of the week. Summer heat. I know I just whined about it being hot. (laughs) But I will take being hot over the slightest bit of chill any day. I hate being cold. I will cry like a little girl. Man, when I was in the Army, we were in the Mojave Desert at this place called the National Training Center. That place sucks. It sucks forever. And it was February. And I'm like, oh, we're going to the desert. And people are like, it's going to be cold. I'm like, okay, it's going to be cold. And I brought like an extra turtleneck to wear under my flight suit and this like one kind of jacket that I had. I'm like, here we go. You know, it's cold. It was the coldest I'd ever been in my entire life. Like it was in the teens every single day and it Mm. dropped down to like the zeros. And we were in a circus tent. And it was just like a bunch of people in a circus tent sleeping in sleeping bags. And I remember I just, I would shiver myself to sleep. And I'd Hmm. wake up and just be so stinking cold. That it hurt. And like, ugh. I hate being cold. That's yeah. my worst, like, my worst death. Not drowning or falling, like, freezing to death. Freezing to death. I always feel like I'm freezing to death. I mean, I think it's about, like, preparation. If I was in a t-shirt and it was 10 degrees, I would hate that for sure. And, like, you, that would kill you eventually, right? Yep. Um... But if you're prepared, I really like being in cold weather with, like, cold weather clothes. And I would prefer to wear jeans and a long sleeve shirt pretty much every day for my life. That would be, mm. that's, you know, my default. Your comfy state? Yep. Um, but, you know, my dad is the opposite. We were talking, actually, talking about it a couple days ago. Have I told the story on here about him shivering? I don't think so, but you do it too. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's really funny. But when he gets really, really cold, he shivers and cannot stop shivering. And I do that when I get really, really cold and and I'm not prepared for it. Um, But he he's the same way. He would he would be hot all day long and take the just like leave the cold out of it completely. But not me. There's, There's something about like a lot of heat, and I think part of the reason I didn't work well in Southeast Georgia was. It's just like stifling. The, it just like makes me. I'm not claustrophobic, but it feels like I'm claustrophobic. I can be in yeah. a wide open area and just that like you're being hugged by the. You're air. being hugged on the inside of your throat <laughs> by soup. That's what it feels like. You gotta breathe the soup. It's so nasty. Yeah, I yeah. remember the first people talk about a dry heat, <laughs> and I never understood what that meant. Being from Florida, like it's it's yeah. hot outside. Yeah, and then. Like actually feeling a dry heat, and I'm like, oh, it's it's hot, but I'm not like in a a wet blanket kind not, of hot. Yeah, you're not breathing soup. Yeah. All right, what else we got? Mm. Battery operated tools versus corded tools. You know, probably five years ago, I would have said corded all day long. Now I say battery all day long. There, I can't think of other than like the big stationary tools. I cannot think of a corded tool that I would prefer over a battery tool. I'll take this conversation a step further because now the battery operated stuff is all the rage. Battery operated stuff over gas operated equipment. I would avoid gas tools at all cost Hmm. because in the past I've had a chainsaw. I've had multiple lawn mowers. I've had multiple weed eaters and they eventually all die a carburetor death and I (laughs) can't clean it enough and I can't do all the things to get it back again. You don't have any of that. With like a brushless battery tool, man, they just they just work. So I've borrowed your battery operated chainsaw the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't like to go through maybe it's I've charged it up one time, so I know it's been fully charged. And the tree that fell down in our yard is probably good eight to nine inch diameter. I don't know what kind of tree it is. It's scraggly and gross looking. 
Um, but it has it has struggled. Yeah. And so I don't know if that's just because it's it's a battery or <clears throat> if my chainsawing cutting technique is less than optimal. I don't know. But I think it's probably both, honestly. And I don't have a lot of chainsaw experience to be able to like, you know, compare that one against, mm-hmm. but I know that it gets through anything I've tried to cut with it, but I just have to be the contact area, and maybe this somebody knows about chainsaws. Maybe this is the case with chainsaws in general. But the contact area between the wood and the blade has to be relatively small. So if you're trying to cut straight down with that chainsaw through an eight inch thing, it's going to struggle. But if you come in with the tip of it and like rock back and forth, so mm-hmm. the cutting part is relatively small, it'll get through it. So yeah, maybe that's an accommodation for the tool. I don't know, but that's what I do, and it seems to work. Let's see. Uh, this is a true this is Kentucky-based pros and cons Ooh. from Mr. Jackal Froth. Oh, okay. Bourbon. I'm not a bourbon drinker. So I'll say no comment? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm, I'm not either. I tried to be because it's a very man's man thing to do. And hmm. uh, it doesn't taste good. I've never felt that draw to, really? to feel like I need to. Mm. Well, you don't have that. You as a person don't have that kind of, that need to to conform to most things. Hmm. And especially in Kentucky, like not only is it like this man's man kind of bourbon run Swanson kind of deal, <laughs> there's this air of, of decadence and elegance and refinery that goes with, with drinking bourbon. Because so many places in Kentucky have their own special things, so it's oh. like a it's a sports team kind of you you plant your flag where you will on these special types of bourbon. And people have been so ingrained in, and I think in the culture that they can tell the differences between certain ones. And uh, I'm not that way. I'm not that way about most kinds of alcohol. Yeah. And so I think it, it goes beyond just like you drink and get you drunk. Like it's a it's an elegant and hmm. and refined type thing. Which also sounds like something that I wouldn't care about at all. Yep, I get that from you. (laughs) And and I'm not really, I'm not in a group. I know I've admitted to like succumbing to peer pressure and things or needing to conform in a group or maybe just feel like I can put on an air or Mm -hmm. a show just to make it look like I I understand what I'm talking about. Because I I do that. But (laughs) bourbon is one of those things I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what makes this taste better than the other one. You know, everybody's got their stuff that they're interested in. Everybody's Anthony really likes coffee, and you could probably talk to Anthony about coffee for a very long time about the mm-hmm. specifics and the different ways to make it and the different types and all the whatever, you know. People have that about bourbon. People have that about wine. People have that about Star Wars, right? And there's just... Maybe this goes back to the pacing thing. Maybe not. There is so much stuff in the world that I don't care about to such a high degree... That I can think of a thousand things I would rather spend my time doing than talking about bourbon. And that's not that there's anything wrong with bourbon. You know what I mean? Like the specifics and the nitty gritty of wine or of coffee or of what. I can just think of a million things I would rather do than have that conversation. That's I don't me. know if there's, there's a, a bunch thing. of stuff like that that I just, I mean, sports are the same way. Like I, yeah. that's not, it's not me. It's not my thing. But. The other Kentucky things. Horse racing. Uh, have you ever been to a horse race? I probably have. Not that I really remember. But there again, millions of other things I would rather be doing with that two or three minutes of time or the two hours it takes to get there and watch the two or three minutes and get back. You know, nothing wrong with it, just not my thing. Have you I ever went, seen a horse race? No. no. I, I don't get it. <laughs> well, see, there's the multiple little- horses... No, no, no. And they're in a little, Hold like, on. track. I'm having an epiphany about Kentucky. Okay. My my newfound homeland. Okay. That if you, if you hype it up to be fancy enough, no matter what the vice is, it can become decadent. <laughs> oh, that's everywhere. That's not that's Kentucky. Just, it's gambling. Oh, yeah. But, like, really fancy hats. <laughs> and really pretty dresses. Yeah. But that's really what you're doing. Like oh, you're gonna, yeah. You're betting on the ponies, right? Yeah. So in one state... That's like a, a vice that your your sad uncle does on the weekends. But here it's like a really fancy thing where kids get out of school because of the horse races. <laughs> I think the difference is that most of, and this is an assumption only, most of the people that go to the horse races here 
don't do it the rest of the time. They don't do it out of derby season. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, your Uncle Jimmy, who has a gambling problem, probably does it every weekend because hmm. he has a problem. Uh, yeah. That's my assumption, but I don't really And know. the same thing with bourbon. Like, they're really proud of the fact that a lot of things sustained prohibition. And because I remember we went to this distillery uh, and there were certain bourbon companies that were allowed to continue to make bourbon through prohibition because it was medicinal. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. So there's loopholes in it. And then there's this really cool speakeasy in, in Louisville that I talked about. Like, it's neat. But again, it's like, well, we're, it's, it's drinking. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, like, what other kind of vice, like, if Kentucky were to adopt uh, legalized uh, recreational marijuana, like it, it would how a fancy, fancy thing. thing it would be. <laughs> It'd be at like the most opulent, uh, yeah. fancy manner, and have these you know those like big metal dishes, bowl things that cover up like fancy dinners when you set it down, and they'd be like, <laughs> it's like a pile pot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean it's the stickiest of the icky, sir. It uh, mm-hmm. it is possible that that would happen. Maybe that's what maybe it, it will. Who knows? <laughs> maybe we need to to get on board with. The, marijuana growing just so that we can make fancy hats and stuff around it. I, I think we could leave that one to someone else. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, it's an investment opportunity. Uh, yeah. But that's, I don't know. Like that's, that's it's, it's fun to, to speculate. Like, I know it's part of the culture, which is neat, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's a vice anywhere else unless you're wearing cute clothes. And yeah, that's true. If your socks match your pocket square <laughs> while your lady's wearing a hat that's five times the circumference of her head it's funny man we were in the airport because we uh came back from was that maker fair when no i hit the microphone we were coming back from the uk on the derby weekend so everybody was no we were leaving that's what it was we were leaving in the airport when everybody was starting to come in for the weekend of the derby and there were so many women who were wearing like normal daily clothes like plain clothes Mm -hmm. literally plain clothes Mm -hmm. But they were wearing their derby hats because they were so big, there was no way to transport them like safely. <laughs> so they're just like walking through the airport with these gigantic hats. Pretty funny. All right, let's do one more. Okay. <clears throat> do it. Mm, there was one is? more picture. Where's the other picture? I'm almost done with bag number um, one of this thing. This just says the Ewok movies. Oh, have you ever seen those? No. I have only seen them once, and I was very young. I know for a fact that they're terrible. Are these these are cartoons? No, no, no. Well, I, there was. I remember some it. Sort of a Ewok cartoon. cartoon. No, they were live action movies set on. I guess they were set on Endor, where there was like a family. It was like a Swiss Family Robinson kind of thing. I think I don't remember. This family crashed there or something and became a humanoid f- family. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And became friends with Ewoks. Hmm. And they like lived over. There were two or maybe even three. movies. They didn't try to eat them. No. First off, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. It seems maybe culturally <laughs> consistent with Ewok tradition. But it, uh, there were two or maybe even three movies, um, and there was a, one of the main characters was a little girl who was not Drew Barrymore, but looked very much like Drew Barrymore in that hmm. age range. I don't think it was her. Pretty sure it wasn't. But yeah, I I know they're bad, but I don't remember them enough to really know anything else about them. And I'm. Honestly, not interested enough to track them down and try to watch them because yeah. I think they would be bad. So, Return of the Jedi came out in '83. Mm, sounds right. Yeah, and I was born in '84, mm. so I remember growing up like my family would watch it, and we would watch the, the Star Wars trilogy on VHS. And I remember liking Return of the Jedi. Yeah, because it was just I I liked that movie. I liked Luke Skywalker, and I remember all of my adult family like ragging on me because I liked the Ewoks. Really? And I think it was akin to like us kind of making fun of the younger people that think Jar Jar is unironically awesome. Yeah. And I remember like, what's your big deal with Ewoks? Like, they were little furry things that just toppled these massive mechanical things. Like, that seems pretty cool. Yeah. I remember there being a lot of like pushback from the Ewoks, and I was like, well, I don't mind them. I mean, I wonder if they see the, the yub yub. bikes were so cool. Like, yeah. You know. But I wonder if they see the yub yub dance as the re release, like, Flute nose oh. looking thingy inside of Jabba's palace when that came back out. Yeah, because I hate that scene. <laughs> huh? I wonder if that's how they see that interaction. They're like the dumb little bears. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you with one thought. Did you know that Chewbacca has a son named Lumpy? 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. In case you didn't know that, now you know. He's got some named Lumpy. All right. Where can people find you? Uh, on Instagram and Twitter at Josh underscore make stuff. Unifying the titles, the Twitter handles. Thingies. And all the Twitters. Uh, you can find all of us at I Like to Make Stuff on all the stuff. And if you like this show and you want to help us out, the Patreon for I Like to Make Stuff is the best way to do that. And you get to be a part of the Discord and you can leave us pros and cons and stuff. So, um, oh, a big thanks to the people who have been sending us messages on Instagram to the No Instructions podcast Instagram handle. Yep. Telling us about the show. That's really cool. It's nice to see those messages. Anthony is really active in the Discord server. Yeah. And I go on there every once in a while. And it's really refreshing to hear other people talk about, you know, the stuff that we are talking about and how it's mm-hmm. relating to their parenting journey. Yeah. Because um, I, I had a, a very rough parenting the last couple of days. Mm. And I think it kind of came to resolution. But it's... <laughs> it's really heartwarming to know that there are other people that are figuring it out. Yeah. And or looking for other people who may not have the right answers but are trying their best to trudge along and, and make a, a solid path. Wading through it yeah. at the same time. Yeah, for sure. So, so thank you to everybody. Yep. Thanks for those messages. Uh, all right. That's it, I guess. Yeah, man. Cool. See you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.